Hi, it's Oz with GNAT News. You know, I'm a baby boomer, so my school years were the 60s and 70s. And during those years, I witnessed a lot of fights. And my hands aren't clean. I was in some of those fights. And when I look back on those days, it feels like the baby boomers were just a violent bunch of kids. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And quite frankly, witnessing fights seemed just like a normal part of the day. And that's so strange because when I talk to my kids today, they didn't have that experience. In fact, they may have one or two examples of bullying or fights, but nothing to the amount that I had. So we're going to talk to this guy today. I'm Michael Dryblatt. I am the youth educator for Project Against Violent Encounters. And I'm going to ask him, were kids just more violent back then? And if they were or if they're not anymore, what happened? What changed? So let's go talk to Mike. Were we in the 60s and 70s, this baby boomer group, were we right. just a more violent breed of kids? It does seem that, uh, from the research, that bullying has been with us and continues to be with us at rather stable numbers. Right now we are in a period where actually bullying is going down to a certain extent, uh, but largely the bullying numbers have been rather consistent over the past 40 years. What has changed is society's willingness to simply accept violence. Uh, boys will duke it out. Girls have to work that out. She only punches you in the arm because she likes you. That sort uh, of thing right. we have changed as a society. So now instead of seeing people duking it out behind the schoolyard or you know, uh, um, seeing violence that way where they're going to work it out, we instead hear name calling, uh, racist language, sexist language, uh, cyber bullying, leaving people out, ostracizing. Now, Mike, what made, what made schools decide to go after it and fight it? I mean, as opposed yeah. to saying, they just got to get it out of their system. Well, those of us who remember the events of the late 1990s when we had that whole rash of school shootings, at that time, Columbine was the worst of them all, and the Secret Service was commissioned to do a report to find out what is the commonality among school shooters. They did a report, they did a follow-up report, and the right. FBI did a report also, and they found that somewhere around three-quarters of all school shooters had been the victims the victims of ongoing, long-term, known about bullying that either school admi administrators did not respond to or their response was ineffective. And so it seems that these kids at some point were take it, take it, take it, take it, take it, right. and then said, I'm not going to take it anymore, and came and shot up the place. And there became this connection between school shootings and bullying. And they said, whoa, if we want to get a handle on school shootings, we need to get a handle on our bullying prevention. Do you see any connection between not letting these children continue using violence for a mm -hmm. bit and, and the fact that now we have students that seem to go off the deep end, like when you and I were in school, mm -hmm. there was never a story of a kid bringing a gun to school to shoot at people. So when we're talking about bullying, now again, each state defines it slightly differently. Right. Vermont actually has a bullying prevention law where it lists the definition of what bullying is, who's involved, uh, so, so it's actually defined. Uh, but generally, for most people, if you think about bullying, as bullying is the abuse of the difference in power, Somebody right. has more power, somebody has less power, and those with more power really are abusing those who have less power. Right. That's different than a fight. That's different than a misbehavior. That's different than a conflict. A fight, a misbehavior, we're relatively equals. We have about the same status. When a fight is gotcha. usually a one and done. Right. Uh, you know, we work it out, you know, we had whatever issues, and it's done. Bullying is ongoing, repeated, health-harming uh, sort of behavior with this five against one, or right. we've got the language better than you do, or there's more of us, or you yes, know, we have the yes. size. It's that this is not a fair fight. We're talking about that abuse of the difference in power, which is very different than what you're describing, which is more of the fight right. or the misbehavior or conflict. Also needs to be addressed. But we wouldn't call that bullying. Right. Um, because the bullying strikes at a deeper level on children. Usually because of that abuse of the difference in power right. repeated over time. What's happened to bullying? Yeah. Oh, if, if my sons don't see it so much in school, um, then have those programs made it go away? Yeah, uh, so we, we do see that in schools that 
work at bullying prevention that have ongoing long-term programs, usually of two years or more, we absolutely see reductions uh, of bullying numbers. That's not only in Vermont, but nationwide, schools that really give a good concerted effort, usually for two years or longer, that's when we see the numbers change. Because you're changing mentality. You're changing people's expectations. Now, and is that the bullies too, Mike? Absolutely. So, yeah. so, so what you're saying is they can actually, these programs can actually get to the bully and say, maybe there's a different type of human being you should become. We, in any bullying situation, if you think about it, you have three groups that are represented. You have the bully who starts the dynamic, you have the targeted person who's the object of the dynamic, and you've got the bystanders, the crowd. Right. We need to make sure that we're getting all three of those groups. All of those are our children. All of those are our students. Right. That student who's bullying needs help to understand how do you use your power for good and not evil. If you've got leadership skills and you're able to get others to follow you, how can you use that for good and not evil to, to help others and not hurt others? By making connections, by having them brought closer to us. For that targeted child, how do we make sure that they find a place and a community where they're valued? How do we give bystanders that voice so that when they see something, they say, hey, knock it off, we don't do that here. Right. Interestingly enough, it's the bully that starts off the dynamic, but it's the bystanders that control the dynamic. Really? If the bystanders say, man, we don't do that here, knock it off, bullying tends to go down. Because the crowd has switched sides on the bully. It, so here's some interesting research. They set up cameras and they recorded recesses for six months straight. Elementary, middle, high school, right. rural, urban, suburban. They did not watch the films live. They came back six months later, took out the films, timed everything out. Average bullying episode was 28 seconds. Average bullying episode. When bystanders got involved, when bystanders intervened, the time dropped to seven seconds. Normally 28 wow. seconds, when bystanders right. got involved, it drops to seven seconds. Now I'm sure if you're the kid getting bullied, that's a long seven yes. seconds. Right. A lot better than 28 seconds. Bystanders control the dynamic. If they can come up with that language, right. they're going to stop, be able to stop the bullying. A lot of times the, the trick is getting that first kid to go over and say, man, we don't do that here. Leave right. her alone, knock that off. And then they kind of rush in, getting them to break the ice, so to speak, yeah. that's the trick. But after that, they, they all sort of kind of rush in because most kids don't really like the bullying. They just don't have the language or they're not sure how to respond right. or what do I say or are they gonna come after me? And so they accept it, not because they so much like it, they just lack the ability to, to respond. And that's where education comes in. That's where our program comes in. Do we know if, if bullies like to be bullies? Now that's interesting. Bullies often are hurting themselves. Uh, there's a lot of good research that says today's bully, 18 months to two years ago, was a target. So when I was in fifth grade, they used to beat on me, and now when I'm seven, in seventh grade, I beat on them, so, right. sort of thing. Kind of rolls downhill. So we know that, that targets, actually, if they're not taken care of, if they don't process their feelings well, they run the risk of becoming bullies themselves and kind of keeping the cycle going. Which brings us back to um, an active shooter. You're right. So then the one that is the target mm -hmm. can then split in two different directions. They can become the bully themselves or they become a very dangerous target. Yeah, the good news is, is that most kids who get bullied will not become violent, do not become s school shooters. We, we do know that there is this very small proportion and we need to deal with that. But by and large, most students who are bullied, and we know that because of the numbers of students that get bullied and who don't in fact become school shooters. But, but yes, it, it is something that we have to watch out for. Will they become uh, a reactive target? where they react and now right. they've almost become the bully themselves? Right. Are they going to take on, are they going to say, look, society isn't helping me. This is going to continue forever. I need to take uh, matters into my own hands. And that's where we see school shooters sometimes coming to school with weapons. A lot of times they come with weapons because they're trying to say, just leave me alone. Right. See, I stay away. And uh, of course, that's an inappropriate way to respond, but we can almost hear the desperation. When you're looking out, Mike, so mm -hmm. do you feel like 
our ability to handle this whole awful dynamic that you mm -hmm. and I both grew up with. Do you feel that we as a society are learning how to slowly just wipe it out like a disease? Or as you, s you sort of hinted at in the beginning, this thing is just born, every new crop of kids is right. born with it, and we got to catch it and say, don't let this disease spread in the new batch of babies that are just born. Yeah, it, it, wouldn't it be nice if we could just inoculate society and just suck? <laughs> Everybody so gets a shot. Bad. Right, but, but, <laughs> but yeah. as, as what happens with all forms of education, we teach this group, they grow up, we have another group that we have to teach. Education is this ongoing process whether it's bullying prevention, healthy relationships, problem solving. Once we teach this group, we have to teach the next group. Once we teach that right. group. And so it's an ongoing process. But again, schools that make this part of their culture, it becomes easier over time because that new group of students that come in, right. they come into a culture that says, we don't do that. And most students fall in line with cultural expectations. Right. If the cultural expectation is we're violent here, and you better defend yourself, students will meet that challenge. If the expectation is we work things out and we use our words and we use our resources, students will fall in line to that also. That's where a school culture becomes so important. And that's why in Vermont, we also put a lot of emphasis, not just on bullying prevention, but creating that school climate, that school culture where there's attachment between students and, and adults, where they actually have relationships with each other, where somebody comes and talks to me and listens to me and, and goes out of their way to say hello to me and creates that relationship. And so therefore, if they see that something is wrong, we now have a relationship and we can talk. Right. It's not just, who's this adult who I've never talked to who's all of a sudden trying to be my pal? They've actually been there for me all along, and now when I need a resource, I know you're a good guy or a good gal and I can yeah. actually trust you. If a child is being bullied, mm -hmm. will he tell his parents? Some students will, uh, some students won't. Many students are embarrassed or somehow uh, they don't want to look bad in their parents' eyes or something along those lines. Or they, it's just hard to talk to your parents about bullying. Uh, many times they won't go to school officials either. That's why you need to talk with your children and check in and know what's right. going on in their lives. And also talk to their friends. Not, we're not grilling, we're not drilling. <laughs> but you know, sometimes you hear more from your child's friends. Yes. That's why it's good to be the parent right. who drives in the car because sometimes you hear stuff. That's right. why it's good to be the house where people come to because sometimes you could be standing off to the side right. just kind of doing things and you hear what's happening. And then that's, you can send a message to another parent. Right, that's how, you, that's, that's how you know what's going on. If you're not checking in with your child, if you're not hearing about what's going on in their lives, they're not all of a sudden going to come to you. They haven't had that comfort. Uh, but if you're checking in a regular part of their lives, it's stacking the odds. It's making it more likely that they're going to come to you. Still not a guarantee, but it's making it more likely. I got gotcha. you. So, thanks, Mike. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.